Okay, Paul, so we've uh, reached May 2021, so the nights are getting very short for us now, but um, there's still lots up there to see. So as usual, let's start with the solar system, and we'll begin with Mercury. We were a bit dismissive of Mercury last month, I think, in our virtual planetarium, because um, it didn't start off well at the beginning of April, and then it went into conjunction, then it started to climb back up into the evening sky. But as we've gone through from April into this month, May, it's going to look pretty good, you know. Yes, it's, uh, we, so this time we'll talk Mercury up and encourage people to observe it. Uh, <laughs> it is a lot better this time round. Uh, on the 1st of May, Mercury shines at magnitude minus 1.0 and sets 90 minutes uh, after the sun. And that's actually pretty good. Uh, magnitude minus 1 is fairly bright. And 90 minutes after the sun does give you plenty of time to get out there and find it. Uh, but you've also got Venus nearby, of course, because Venus will be five degrees away from Mercury on the 1st of May. So that's a, a great way of locating Mercury if you're struggling with it, because Venus is made minus 3.8. Yes, and you really can't miss that. So all you have to do is locate Venus in the evening sky, and Mercury is not far away. Now, on the 3rd of May, Mercury will drift about 2.3 degrees south of the Pleiades open cluster M45. Um, it'll be shining to about magnitude minus 0.8 eight on that date so a little bit fainter than on the first uh, but mercury should be quite easily visible through the evening twilight although it's going to be harder to see the pleiades cluster in the evening twilight yeah you need to let them get quite low down so you need a really flat horizon um, to see them because the sky's got to darken enough for them to come out but again a camera might be able to pick that up better anyway. Um, on the 13th of May, Mercury will have dimmed to magnitude plus 0.2, but should be easy to spot as it lies 2.7 degrees to the north of a 3% lit waxing crescent moon. Um, and on that date, this is really impressive for Mercury. Mercury sets an impressive 135 minutes after the sun. So you've got plenty of time to pick it up then. Yeah, over two hours after the sun, that is pretty good. And you might be able to see some surface features because uh, uh, if you've got a, a reasonably large telescope, you might make out uh, in the telescope the uh, faint darker patches. And I always find visually in a telescope, Mercury does have a sort of orange colour. So it's uh, quite quite pronounced, actually. It isn't just a white featureless blob. Do you, is that an observation made when it's low down? Um, no, it's an observation I've made in the evening when it's low down. It's also an observation I've made when the planet's been quite high in the daytime sky. Okay. It always kind of has this orange... It's very similar to Mars, only not quite as strong, but that, that sort of salmon orange glow to it. Okay. Well, greatest eastern elongation occurs on the 17th of May when Mercury will be at magnitude plus 0 0.6. And after this, the planet will continue to dim, but remains visible thanks to a reapproach of Venus. On the 28th of May, Mag plus 12.2 Mercury sits just 32 arc minutes from Venus and sets 90 minutes after the Sun. So that's going to be fantastic, really. It's a very good opportunity for spotting Mercury if you've never seen it before. You should be able to pick it up way before that, but if you have struggle, um, go out on the 28th of May, find Venus, look at Venus through... Um, a telescope or binoculars obviously make sure the sun is set first and then right next to it will be uh, mercury well um sticking with the inner solar system because they are putting on a fantastic show for us um venus as you've said pete a couple of times now it's a it is still an evening planet setting 50 minutes after the sun on the first of may and that extends to one and a half hours uh, after the uh, visible after the sun has set by the end of the month uh, we have some nice pairings, so a thin moon, less than 1%, will sit 2.1 degrees southwest of Venus on the 12th of May. And on that date, Venus will set 70 minutes after the sun. So that'll, that'll be a nice thing to catch. For, but 1%... Crescent Moon is really quite a challenge to pick up visually. It is indeed. There are some really nice thin uh, crescent moons uh, visible during 2021. So uh, I would get used to them if I were you. But um, yeah, 1%. It's not like a regular moon at all. The moon will be so dim against the twilight sky. It's often quite uh, tricky to pick up. Um, but despite the bright evening twilight at this time of year, Mag minus 3.9 Venus should stand out well after the sun has dropped below the horizon. It's currently on the far side of its orbit from Earth, and as a consequence, 
through a telescope, it appears pretty small, well, for Venus anyway. Yes, and, and, it does. And almost fully lit with a phase which decreases from 99% on the 1st of May to 96% on the 31st of May. So you're not going to notice a great deal of difference um, when looking at Venus. No, it, uh, it's, it's hard to see details in the clouds of Venus anyway, so it's probably going to look pretty featureless during this time. It's going to take a little while for the phase to drop down and the apparent diameter to increase as the planet slowly catches up with the Earth. Um, in a similar sort of situation, moving away and becoming quite faint now is the planet Mars. Um, the already diminished apparent size drops even further during May. Uh, it's 4.6 arc seconds in apparent diameter on the 1st of May, and that shrinks down to 4.2 arc seconds uh, by the end of the month. Ouch. And the planet is really it's really struggling now to keep ahead of the encroaching evening twilight. Yeah. So uh, it's going to be a hard job, I think, now to, to, to get anything more out of this uh, particular opposition. Yeah, which is a, is a pity, but it, it'll be back. Uh, it's worth noting there's a 14% lit waxing crescent moon near to Mars on the evening of the 15th of May. OK, so let's go out to the gas giants. Uh, Jupiter is a morning planet which reaches 14 degrees altitude at sunrise on the 1st of May, rising 70 minutes before the sun. Um, there's a 35% lit waning crescent moon uh, 5.9 degrees south-southeast of Jupiter on the morning of the 5th of May. By the end of the month, Jupiter's visibility will have improved slightly, the planet now rising three hours before the sun and able to reach an altitude of 20 degrees, which is not bad, is it? No, I mean, was it a year or two ago? We would have bitten somebody's hand off for 20 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's pretty good. And... Of course, if you've got a small telescope, Jupiter is the planet that keeps on giving because there's so much uh, detail to see on it. Uh, a small telescope will reveal the main equatorial bands and now it's getting higher. I wouldn't be at all surprised if you see a few other bands like the North Temperate Belt, South Temperate Belt. Uh, and a lot of these bands show considerable vari variability over time. And larger telescopes will, of course, pick out all those interesting storms and features that reside in each of these belts. So Absolutely, it's a, yeah. It's the the amateur's friend, Pete. Well, Jupiter actually reaches its own equinox on the 2nd of May. So that's basically um, when the centre of the sun would appear on the projection of Jupiter's equatorial plane, as seen from Jupiter itself. Um, and from Earth, this is the time when the four largest and brightest Galilean moons can appear to interact with one another in what are known as mutual events. So we're going to get a number of these. They run through, I think the last one is in November 2021. So we're going to be reporting on lots of these in Sky at Night magazine. So don't miss them. No, and they are good fun to watch. Uh, but my favourite ones involve the outermost Galilean moons, uh, Ganymede and Callisto. Uh, we had Io and Callisto in the last VP. Uh, but it's always good fun to watch those outer two moons because... Uh, they are rarely involved with it's harder to catch the phenomena, interesting phenomena of them because they're much further out in their orbits away from from Jupiter. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, Saturn's also in the morning sky at the moment. It's in the constellation of Capricornus, shining away at magnitude plus zero point seven. Um, and there's a fifty-seven percent lit waning gibbous moon near to Saturn on the morning of the third of May, and as a forty-six percent lit crescent on the 4th of May and then the moon actually manages to go all the way around and revisits on the morning of the 31st of May it's a long month May um, with a larger 72% lit waning gibbous phase Saturn's actually not too bad I mean you've got Jupiter which gets up to 20 degrees but Saturn's able to reach an altitude of 17 degrees at the end of May yeah so that's pretty good um, both these planets have languished low in the uh, southern skies but we're starting to claim them back they're starting to get higher uh, moving out into the outermost parts of the solar system Uranus and Neptune they aren't visible this month so we might as well move on to the specials and we have uh, a number of them to watch out for this month we'll start off on the 6th of May the Eta Aquarid meteor shower which peaks at 0400 BST so 0300 UT um, in the morning uh, the observing window for this shower is actually quite short from the UK yes, and it's it is. probably best seen between half two 
uh, and the uh, start of the morning twilight. Um, there will be a 27% lit waning crescent moon, but that won't interfere as it doesn't w- it doesn't rise up in the sky until dawn is well underway. So uh, it's a good maybe a good shower to try and catch this time. It's a tricky one, the Eta Aquarius. It's best suited for the southern hemisphere, really. Um, but it's just that really short window because dawn starts... A couple of hours. <laughs> well, if that, yeah. it's Because it's, the night is so short during uh, May. Um, so it's always a, a bit of a bit of a tricky one, but you might catch a nice long um, meteor trail coming from the shower if you do early in the morning. It's worth tracing it back. If it comes from that region known as the water jar or uh, more contemporary times it's known as a steering wheel that's most likely to make it an eater aquarid meteor um but also on the sixth it's worth and this is on the morning of the sixth it's worth noting that io's shadow will eclipse europa between 0426 and 0432 bst that's not a very big window that's six minutes no uh, and no doubt if a cloud comes along between those uh, times, then you'll, you'll, you'll miss it. But <laughs> Jupiter will be well above the horizon by then. So uh, if you've got a clear sky and a clear horizon, that's well worth going for. Yeah, OK. Actually, there's another uh, event on the 14th of May where Ganymede's shadow will partially eclipse Io between 0443 and 0453 BST. So these are really quick, these events. There's yeah. none of this, there's none of this <laughs> hanging on like, like watching a transit of venus where you're there for what six hours or so watching the dot moving across the sun you've just got a few minutes with these mutual events yes. to actually get it done so you've got to be on the ball there but let's go back a couple of days on the 12th uh, there's a thin moon viewing opportunity in the evening if you can locate the bright magnitude minus 3.8 planet venus low above the west northwest horizon approximately 30 minutes after sunset there's a less than one percent lit waxing crescent moon sitting two degrees below the planet as seen from the uk so that's uh, another one of these very thin lit crescent moons another thin, less than one yeah. percent that's really quite quite tough to see visually uh, but worth trying. Um, on the 13th of May, we have a, a slightly more lit crescent moon, a 3% lit waxing crescent moon, and it lies some 2.7 degrees from magnitude 0.2 Mercury. Uh, in fact, the moon, Mercury and Venus at magnitude minus 3.8 uh, make a nice sun-pointing isosceles triangle above the west-northwestern horizon. It's visible about 40 minutes after sunset. That's a nice thing to look out for. Um on the 15th, uh, we have a, the moon at 14% lit um, as a waxing crescent again, and that will occult the magnitude 3 star Mebsuta, which is Epsilon Geminorum. Um, and that occurs, well, the occultation begins uh, from around 2335 uh, BST to 0004 bst on the 16th and the times do vary a little bit with locations so it's best to sort of go out a little bit earlier for that um planet mars will be located 3.3 degrees west of the moon at the end of the occultation too on the 17th of may mercury reaches its greatest eastern elongation and it's separated by the sun by some 22 degrees in the evening sky um, so catch it and it's in a solar system neighbour approximately 40 minutes after sunset, uh, low, it is quite low, above the northwestern horizon. Yeah, OK. Well, actually, on that evening as well, we've got the 31% lit waxing crescent moon, 3.1 degrees from M44, the beehive cluster. So um, that'll be quite a nice pairing as well. That's quite close to it. Uh, we've got... A popular clear obscure effect happening on the 18th, on the evening of the 18th, when the lunar X and V will be visible. Um, the giant floating letters can be seen starting to form on the moon's terminator in the run up to midnight and should be fully formed about 0044 BST on the 19th of May. Have you you've observed those two letters? I have. Uh, I have to say, uh, it's but the first, I. 
it was it was you that pointed them out to me, and I thought, oh, it's going to be another one of Pete's things that are actually quite vague. What do you, what do you mean? Not. <laughs> they still, well, some of the things you wax lyrical about are not immediately obvious, uh, but uh, I was actually quite surprised just by... I tell you what, the Luna X, it reminded me of the opening title sequence of the X-Files when the X stands out in the titles. Uh, it is quite striking. You can see the Luna X and the V standing out really well. That's probably because it's a, a real good contrast between the brilliant lit features and the dark black shadows. So yeah, okay. uh, they, they really are quite striking. Well, um, well it's worth noting, actually, um, as we head into the last week of May, hopefully it won't be too vague for you, um, but the doors begin to open on Noctilucent Clouds season. Uh, yes, and we've had some good <laughs> displays in recent years, actually. Uh, but uh, it's very difficult to say when exactly they'll be about. But uh, the, the clouds are typically seen, if they're there, that between late late May and early August, um, about 90 to 120 minutes after sunset, lower above the, uh, the northwestern horizon, or a similar time before sunrise in the other side of the sky, the low in the northeastern horizon. But they can be. We've had some very good displays from Leicestershire, uh, and I know you're a bit of a fan of Noctilucent Clouds, aren't you, Pete? Well, last year, of course, they occurred around the time when uh, we had Comet Neowise, F3 Neowise, in the sky. And I do remember very um, distinctly one evening where I was watching... A, a fairly weak display of noctilucent clouds as the sun, or after the sun had set uh, low above the northwest horizon. And I got a call from you saying, There's some fantastic noctilucent clouds visible in the northeast. And of course, that breaks the rules that, you know, yes. they're supposed to be in the northwest <laughs> after sunset and northeast before dawn. And they were there, they were really bright as well. Yes, despite your scepticism, which I could tell in solar masses <laughs> over the phone, that you thought I was looking in the wrong direction, uh, they were, it was quite a powerful display. Perhaps Incredible. actually some of the best display I'd seen in a long time. Yeah. Uh, so maybe maybe we'll get some rule-breaking noctilucent clouds again this season. Let's hope so. OK, well, on the 26th of May, um, we've got full moon. And this one occurs approximately nine hours after perigee, which makes this the brightest and largest full moon for 2021. Let's have a little cheer. Yay! What will we call this supermoon? <laughs> the June supermoon. <laughs> no, it's May. Yeah, that's the irony. It's the June supermoon because <laughs> it occurs in May. <laughs> All okay. right, I'll on the 28th, visible approximately one hour after sunset, we have magnitude minus 3.8 Venus. Uh, it's still half a degree away from magnitude 2.3 Mercury, so there's another chance at the end of the month to, to grab it. And then on the 29th, this is the one I'm really interested in, Ganymede's shadow eclipses the majority of Io's disk in the morning from 0327 to 0417 BST. That's a good one to watch, particularly if you've got a telescope larger than six inches, because uh, those that, that size telescope does reveal the Galilean satellites as disks. And it'd be interesting to see if how much detail, whether you could tell how much of Io is being eclipsed uh, just, just with a reasonable size telescope and magnification. So I think that will be a very interesting one. Yeah, absolutely. But if you've got a small telescope, don't be put off because oh, no. what, what you'll see will be the dot um, of Io and it will just fade in brightness over that period from, as Paul said, 0327 to 0417 BST. So that's actually quite a long event because... Ganymede's shadow is quite large and Ganymede moves quite slowly. Um, so um, that's going to be one to look out for, isn't it? It is, and one I'm looking forward to. OK, the night sky then, let's move out to the uh, sort of general universe. And in the night sky, the plough, or the source bonasterism, as we call it, sits almost at the zenith, so it's, it's quite high up. And if we follow the natural curve of its handle away from the pan, uh, we curve round to the lovely orange-coloured star Arcturus in Bertis the Herdsman. And the brightest nighttime star in the northern half of the sky. That's the claim you usually make for it, isn't it? Well, it's, a, it's quite striking, actually, isn't it? It is a very striking star, and the orange colour, I think, is particularly uh, pronounced. Um, it's uh, the brightest star of Buretis, so it's Alpha Buretis, 
the herdsman is a sort of kite shaped constellation um, the kite being as long as the saucepan is wide how about that yeah which which is a good way of describing it because um, you know describing shapes in the night sky is not particularly useful unless you know what scale they are if something is a square or a triangle if if it's tiny or if it's large makes quite a big difference so yeah that that gives you a good sense of the size of that kite shaped constellation and it is very distinctly um kite shaped it is uh it is quite a, a, a i'm not sure if i could quite see a, a herdsman in there but the, the constellation itself is quite a compact well-defined constellation yes it is there's not a lot in there in terms of uh deep sky objects there's quite a few double stars um uh, there's some variable stars, V Bootis, for of example, course, yeah. is a star that I follow. So uh, there's a there are a number of uh, stellar objects, but uh, yeah, there's not much in the way of deep sky here. Okay, well, if you keep the saucepan's handle curve going through Arcturus, um, you'll eventually arrive at the bright white spiker, uh, which is also Alpha Virginis, and the saying goes: Follow the arc to Arcturus and speed on to Spiker. Um, and of course, Virgo contains the large semicircular shape, which is known as the bowl of Virgo asterism. Um, and some see it as a bowl and spiker joined together, which form a, a giant Y pattern. I don't know if you've ever seen it like or perceived it like that. It does work, actually. It works quite well. Yeah, it looks more like a dish to me. You could imagine it as a sort of radio telescope bowl. It looks like a radio telescope bowl to me. It looks like the 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 bowl of Virgo is the the dish, and then the rest of the constellation is the sort of support building. It's not that's <laughs> not not quite as romantic as uh, as Virgo, is it? No, never mind. Uh, southeast of Virgo is uh, quite a difficult constellation to make out. It's Libra the Scales, uh, a compact constellation, and I'm going to let you pronounce the names of the two brightest stars because I know you like to say them. You coward. It's two <laughs> brightest stars are Zubanel Janubi, which is Alpha Libri, and Zubanish Shamali, uh, which is Beta Libri, um, and those names translate as the southern and northern claws, respectively. And that betrays their origin as part of Scorpius the Scorpion, the constellation uh, which lies to the southeast of Libra. Um, but it's worth noting that Beta Libri, or Zubanish Shamali, is sometimes referred to as a greenish star. Um, and it's said that there are no green coloured stars and that there's a very specific reason for that that the, the the black body radiation curve when it peaks in the green part of the spectrum which is the middle of the visual range you've got photons from all the other colours longer wavelength and shorter wavelength and they just completely swamp out um, any of the greenish colour uh, so you end up with sort of white because uh, the sun peaks in that area as well doesn't it it does, yes. I, I've never actually... Uh, I don't think I've seen the greenish colour, but it's been a very long time since I had a look, so uh, I, perhaps I should revisit it and, and see. I think you normally see green when you have a, a star in that part of the spectrum and it's near to, a, um, near to an orange-coloured star or maybe a blue star next yes. to an orange-coloured star. It and the colour contrast creates a greenish... Hue. Yeah, you get that with Albira actually. Yeah, you can the secondary can look sort of turquoisey green because of the uh, the orange binary, the orange primary there. Yeah, I think uh, there's another one, isn't there? Isn't uh, is Antares a double with um, a greenish? It is. It is. And again, Antares very orange also has a companion that looks uh, rather greenish. Yeah. Okay. OK, well, Zubanish Shamali and Zubanil Janubi and Gamma Libri form a north-pointing triangle. And if you follow the direction of this for a little over the width of the triangle, you arrive at the bright globular cluster M5, Messier 5. And that's located in the western half of the bifurcated constellation of Serpens the Serpent. It's an unusual constellation, isn't it? Because it, it's, it's split in two, split in two. by <laughs> a fucus with... Um, You've got, let me get this right, uh, Serpent's Cowder to the east and Serpent's Caput to the west. So uh, Caput is the head while Serpent's Cowder is the Serpent's tail. So the Serpent Snake is being held by a fucus. Yeah, it's quite a low-down constellation. and uh, Although uh, a fucus is actually quite a... 
uh, but, uh, it's, it, it looks kind of like a squashed constellation, doesn't it? Uh, uh, to the naked eye, it's rather barren. Uh, but the, 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 the constellations of Serpents, Cowder and Serpents Caput uh, fit uh, either side of it. Uh, the, but there are some interesting p- objects in this part of the sky. In particular, there's a number of interesting globular clusters yeah. uh, that lie inside a few M9, M10, M12, M14, M19, and M107. So there's quite a, although the constellation itself might be somewhat difficult to pick out, there's a number of things in here worth worth looking at. They've got a lovely open cluster as well, IC4665, which lies just north of um, Sebel Ray, which is Beta of Fuci. And to the east of Sebel Ray is a V-shaped asterism, which is known as Poniatowski's Bull, which <laughs> uh, it resembles a fainter version of um, the Hyades and Taurus. It's quite distinctive, actually, if you've never seen it. Um, but at the top of the large coffin-shaped pattern of a fucus, that may sound a bit of a grim way of describing it, but it's actually known in some cultures as the coffin asterism. Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> sits um, Razzle Haig, or Razzle Hagu, however you want to pronounce it, which is Alpha Afuci, um, and that represents the serpent bearer's head. And to the west um, is Razzle Gethi, which is Alpha Hercules, the head of Hercules the Strongman. Yes, and uh, of course in Hercules we find one of the greatest deep sky objects in the Northern Hemisphere. This is the globular cluster M13, which is about a third of the way down the western side of the keystone asterism of the Hercules constellation. Yeah, uh, that's right. It's interesting actually that we've got M13 and we've got M5 because it's often said that M13 is the best globular cluster visible from the Northern Hemisphere. Um, I don't agree with that. I think M, or the, sorry, in the northern half of the sky, so the northern celestial hemisphere, um, I don't agree with that. I think M5 actually gives it a good run for its money. So if you, you've got both of those globular clusters, have a look at them. Uh, M5 is just above the celestial equator. M M three is also quite impressive as well. <laughs> M three is good, yeah. M three is very so good. So I'm not sure. Maybe uh, maybe they're all as good as each other, and uh, there isn't one that's particularly better than any of the others. But uh, between Hercules and Boötes, we have that lovely semicircular pattern of stars, uh, Corona Borealis, the Northern Crown. So yeah, that's a beauty, isn't it? It is. So plenty to see in the night sky. I wish everybody clear skies, and hope they manage to see some of these things and the special events. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Paul.